running well and finishing well. And uh, we have started a study of Nehemiah and the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. And today we're going to start gate number two, which is the fish gate. And I'm sure that we all understand the fish gate is bound to be uh, associated with us making fishers of men, right? So that's pretty obvious. But today I want to look at the history and the background of the fish gate. It's actually only mentioned four times in the Bible. That's all. And we're going to look at two of them that were mentioned well before the time of Nehemiah. And then next week we'll look at the time of Nehemiah. So, as we have started this journey, those of you that have been with me the last few weeks, you know that we start our journey where? At the sheep gate. Because we don't start the Christian journey until we've applied the blood of Jesus Christ and we've accepted him as our Savior. He is the Lamb of God who shed his blood for us. So after we accept him and we've applied the blood to our heart and everything, then we begin our race of faith, right? And so we, we're ready for this, but we know that on our way to gate number two, we ran into what? Two towers of fortification that must be in our life. And so I've got a little bit of the map there, a cropped picture of the map. The sheep gate, but before I get to gate number two, I've got two towers that must be very strong in my life. Now, we learned last week the city of Jerusalem itself has steep ravines and valleys on the east and the west and on the south. What is the most vulnerable direction for the enemy to attack? On the north, because it was much more level. And so we know the enemy is going to be right there, right there. As soon as we apply the blood to our lives and we're born again, who's going to be after me? The enemy, Satan himself. And that's why we need towers of fortification before we ever get to gate number two. We've got to realize and, that we need the armor of God on and we need to be well fortified before we start this journey and as we are starting it. Now, after you and I become born again, discipleship must follow. How many of us were born again and we just kind of got stuck on go? And we were not truly discipled on how to walk in the Spirit and how to grow in Christ and everything. And so we just, I was there, just kind of stuck there, but I was not really taught that after you're born again, I knew the Holy Spirit lived in me. I knew I was sealed with the Holy Spirit, but it was more like now you need to get busy. And so, but we need to take newborn Christians or people like me that were a Christian for many years, but they never really were growing spiritually and coming under the influence of the Holy Spirit and disciple them, start them where they are. And that must follow the sheep gate because remember when they applied the blood at Passover, what did we learn started immediately after Passover? The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which signifies we immediately start feasting on the Word of God. And if we don't feast on the Word of God, we're not going to grow. True? Okay. Now, we learned these two towers. Tower, this is from last week. Tower in Hebrew is the word migdal, and it comes from the verb gadal, which means to grow. So I've accepted Christ at the sheep gate, two towers in front of me, and they both are telling me to grow. And if we look at what's going on there, he says right next to the high priest who represented Jesus Christ at the sheep gate were the men of Jericho. This is a, an amazing thing to me to find in the Bible because the men of Jericho had a curse, right? Because they were told, don't, uh, there's a curse on the city of Jericho. Don't ever try to build it again. And so did Jesus Christ bear the curse for us? Yes, he bore our curse. So here they are right there getting to start their journey with, uh, right by the high priest. And Jericho means we, our walk should have a fragrance. We're now walking by faith. And next to them were the men of Zakur, which means we remember and we bring to our mind we're in this Christian race and it's all because of Jesus, right? Now, so now we're to the fish gate because we've been obedient. We're growing in sanctification. We're feasting on the word of God. And so we are now in a place that we're ready to go to the fish gate, gate number two. I remind you, this is still on what 
portion of the wall. We're still in the north. Is the enemy, are we going to be vulnerable to the enemy? Yes. So here's our fish gate. And here is the message of the fish gate. You are my witnesses. Did y'all hear that? Okay. You are my ambassadors. You are to transform the marketplace and protect the marketplace. If you look at my picture here of the fish gate, when you see the fish gate, you know that this exactly is what it says. Literally, the people from the Mediterranean Sea and from the Sea of Galilee, which is up here, they came to Jerusalem and brought their fish. So they're selling literal fish out there. But what else happened? People, the Gentiles that lived out here in the surrounding areas, what were they bringing to the fish gate? All of their wares. So I think of this kind of like a flea market. This becomes the marketplace. You've got flatter land out here. You've got this gate. And so you've got all these people trying to sell their stuff. Now, when you have Gentiles who were the, they weren't God's people, right? And I'm supposed to be a witness to them. I'm supposed to transform this marketplace and be his ambassador. But we have the Gentiles coming in. What are they bringing with them? Their religion. Are they trying to make money off of the people? Yes. And so we have all this greed coming in. We have all kinds of things coming into the marketplace. Do you see that it is going to become a place that needs transformed? Yes, because all kinds of wickedness is going to be happening here, and we will see that in today's lesson and in next week's lesson. So you and I are called to be the witness to help transform this marketplace because it's become, there's all kinds of people that are not born again there, people that are the rich are making uh, their, what do they call it, where you are charging more than you're supposed to. You know, and so they're making money off of everybody. That's what's going on in this marketplace. We know that God had a master plan for the nation of Israel, right? So he chose to accomplish his plan through a special chosen people of Israel. Do we know that everything that he purposed is going to happen? Because the counsel of the Lord stands forever. So whatever he purposed here and he tells us in his word... Most of it, a lot of it, has not happened yet. But it is going to happen in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, his millennial reign for a thousand years. Because right now, who is ruling this world? Satan, and don't we have all kinds of Gentile leaders? Yes, and so the Gentiles, it's the time of the Gentiles right now until the stone comes from Daniel and crushes all the Gentile kingdoms and Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom, then all these things that were ordained of God, they're going to happen here in the kingdom. Everybody with me? Okay. So God will fulfill his purpose. In Zechariah 2, 8, and 9, he gives a warning. He who touches Israel touches the apple of God's eye. Surely I will shake my hand against him. That is a warning to every leader in the world. When we go against Israel and we want Israel to divide her land, your nation is in trouble because God will not tolerate it. And he says, don't touch them. If we go back to Genesis 3.15, we have what the theologians call the Proto-Evangelium, which is actually the first gospel uh, proclamation. And in Genesis 3.15, what has happened by the third chapter of Genesis? Man has fallen, right? And so God's going to start revealing his plan for the Redeemer, the Messiah. And he says, I will put enmity between thee, who's he talking to? Satan. And the woman between thy seed, you realize Satan has a seed? Who is it? The Antichrist. That's his seed. And her seed, which is Jesus Christ. He will bruise or crush your head and you will bruise his heel. So this is God's first promise that he is going to have a Messiah. 
We fast forward to chapter 12 of Genesis, and he comes to Abram. Remember, he was a, in a pagan area over in the Ur of the Chaldees, just south of Babylon. He had been raised in paganism. And God starts revealing himself to this guy when he's around 70 years old. And he says, I want you to leave your country, and you're going to go to a land that I'm going to show you. Can you even imagine that? I try to put myself in Abraham's place sometimes, and I, it, it's amazing to me that he was willing to do that. You know, but it's going to be counted unto him for righteousness. And he gives him a promise. He says, I will make of thee a great nation. I'm going to bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'm going to bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you. And in thee, here's what I want you to see, all families of the earth will be blessed. Is that every nation? Is that even speaking to the Gentiles? Yes. So all of the families of the earth are supposed to be blessed through Abraham and the nation of Israel that he is going to form. He's going to use one nation to bless all nations. And if they had done what God told them, that would have happened. But in the millennial kingdom, it is going to happen because Jerusalem is going to be raised up and be the highest point on the face of the earth. And we know it's going to be raised up into a big plain. And who is going to be the premier nation for that thousand years? Israel is going to be the premier nation. There are scriptures, uh, I'm not sure where, maybe in Isaiah, maybe Jeremiah. There are scriptures that said 10 Gentiles will come and take the garment of one Jew. Now, would they do that now? Probably not. And say, we want to go with you. We hear that you know the Messiah. We hear that you know the King. You know, and we want to go with you to Jerusalem and learn about him. So they are going to be at a point where they will be the nation that will bless all of the families that are living on earth at that time and reach them. If you look at my little chart right here, it shows the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And we start with Abraham, and it goes to Isaac. Even though Ishmael was his older son, that was not the promised child. Then Isaac had Jacob and Esau. And who was the one? The line was to come through Jacob, not Esau. And then Jacob is going to be the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And son number four, Judah, is the one that the messianic line will come through, Jesus Christ. Now, in Leviticus 20, we move on into Leviticus, and God is still showing that he's choosing Israel. And he says, you will be holy unto me. Well, that hasn't happened. So that will be something that will happen in the millennial kingdom. For I, the Lord, am holy, and I have severed you. I've separated you. I've set you apart from other people that you should be mine. Now, if we go to Deuteronomy, he says, You are a holy people unto the Lord your God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. This was his intention and his purpose for the nation of Israel. He goes on to say, The Lord didn't set his love upon you or choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest. Weren't they a small nation? In fact, with Jacob and his sons, the 12 sons, when they went to Egypt, how many people? How many? What was the number? 70. They only had 70 people. So they go to Egypt and they spend all that time in Egypt. And when they come out of Egypt, they have grown to a couple of million, even under persecution. So God really increased their number, but he, they were very few in the beginning. Why did God choose you? Because the Lord loved you and he's keeping an oath that he swore to your fathers, Abraham. The Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand. He has redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, who was the king of Egypt. They were in bondage, right? Just like you were and I were in bondage before he called us out and redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb. And Pharaoh, remember, is a type of Satan who held them in bondage. And being in Egypt is a type of being in the world and being 
lost in sin. Now, in Deuteronomy 7, he says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, he is faithful, he keeps his covenant and mercy with them. Slow down. That love him and keep his commandments for a thousand generations. You know, I've learned not to just keep reading. Don't just read quickly to say I've read all of this. Slow down and see what's actually there. Now, after the Red Sea, and he has taken them, remember they passed the waters that were bitter, and Moses put the tree in there, and they turned sweet. And then they came over a little bit further, and he uh, struck the rock, and they got water. Now he is bringing them to Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. And remember, God puts on a marvelous display of his majesty and his glory, right? And in fact, it instilled fear in the people. He says, you are going to say to the house of Jacob and the children of Israel, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. Did they see with their own eyes how God, what he did to the Egyptians and all the plagues? How I bore you on eagles' wings. And he said, I've brought you all the way out of there because I wanted to bring you here to myself. So that was a purpose. He said, therefore, now remember when we did this before, we're always looking for the ifs and the thens. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be the special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Do you see the restrictions there? Now, that hasn't really happened yet, but is this going to happen that they will be obeying him and keeping the covenant during his kingdom? Yes. And he says, and you're going to be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Did he originally intend and purpose that all the nation of Israel would be a kingdom of priests? Yes, but that didn't happen, and so he chose the tribe of Levi. They would become the Levitical priest of the time. But during the millennial kingdom, will the nation of Israel be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation for the rest of the world? Yes. Okay, are y'all with me? I, the front row is. I'm wondering about the rest of you. Now, okay. So here we see this little graph somebody designed. And so out here we have all the peoples of the earth. And we have the nation of Israel in the center. And because of their witness, should they be turning all nations to God? Yes, yes that was the purpose. You are supposed to show everybody else in the world and point them to God. And show them what it's like to have this living God. You're to be the witness. So it's like a signpost out there. If people would be watching them, they would point only to God. And the rest of the people in the world then would follow their lead and follow their example. Here's God's promise to him. Let's pay attention to the promise. I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I've appointed for their fathers. Okay. You know what land we're talking about. That's their promised land that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I won't remove the foot, your foot from there again, only if, y'all see those two words? Only if they're careful to do all that I've commanded them, according to the whole law, the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. Were they careful to do that? No. Did he ultimately remove them from the land? Yes, he did. Okay, so the enjoyment of the land was going to depend on obedience. Y'all saw the if. If you do this, then I won't take you out of the land. But they didn't obey. Did he take them out of the land? Yes. Now, we're going to the section now called God's witness on earth. See, the fish gate is all about being the witness. And this is what God had ordained for the nation of Israel. In Isaiah 43, he says, But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he formed you, O Israel, fear not, I've redeemed you, I've called you by name, and you are mine. And in verse 21, 
This people have I formed for myself. Why? So you will show forth my praise. That's another reason they were to show forth the praise of God in their lives to be a witness to all the nations around them. And in verse 10 and 11, he says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord. You're my servant whom I have chosen. Why? So you will know and believe me and understand that I am he. And before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. That's pretty clear. Very clear. So what is a witness? A witness can be someone that says something again and again, and the witness will come behind somebody and strengthen or confirm what that person says. So Israel was to be God's witness, strengthen and confirm everything he says about himself. If God says it, what do I do as his witness? I say it again and say it to confirm it. So he says, you are my witnesses, says the Lord. I am God. So you and I are to draw attention to everyone else. The fact, he says, he is the only God. See, so we've got to know the word of God to know what he says about himself. He says, fear not, neither be afraid. Have not I told you from that time, and I've declared it, you are my witnesses. Does he tell you and I that in the New Testament? Yes. Now, the church has a different calling, but we still are to be the witnesses. We're given the Great Commission, and we're told to be salt and light, right? So this is no different. We're told to be witnesses and disciples and so forth. He says, is there a God beside me? No, there is no God. I know not any. And in Isaiah 45, he says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. So you have to know God's word and know what he says about himself or you can't be a witness to it. If God says, I am the only God, I'm the only Lord, I'm the only Savior, there is nobody else. So what do you as a witness do? You turn around and you confirm it to other people. Yes, he is the only God, he's the only Lord, and there's no, he's the only Savior, and there is none else. So that's what you are to do as a witness. Take what he says about himself, take what this word says, and you tell others, and you confirm what he says about himself. But you've got to know the word, or you can't do that, right? Okay. Now, if we go to the dedication of the temple with Solomon, here's his prayer. That he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all of his ways, Keep his commandments, keep his statutes, keep his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. Let these words, wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord, be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night. Here's your key sentence. That he, God, may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people. Does God keep us? Will he maintain our sanctification and maintain our witness as long as we are submitted to him? Okay, he, he saved me, right? He sanctifies me. Is he responsible for sanctifying me if I'm obedient to be surrendered and yielded to him on the potter's wheel? Yes, he maintains. And Solomon prayed that he would maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel at all times, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no other. That was the purpose. So here's our little graph again, and it says we are to confirm and strengthen what God says about himself. And all the people of the earth should know that the Lord is God if we are doing our command as a witness. If they would have been doing theirs as a witness. There is no other God and everybody around us should know that. Everybody around them should have known it if they were properly witnessing. And he's the redeemer, he's the Messiah, he's the savior. And there is none other. That's what they should have been doing. That's what you and I are to be witnessing about. 
Now, they have some instructions before, uh, this is back in Deuteronomy, I think. He says, listen to, believe, and follow God's word closely. Let your heart, therefore, be loyal to the Lord our God, so you'll walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. You're to practice his word. You are not to add to it or take away from it, and you're to teach the word to your children. Those are a lot of the commands and instructions. So he goes on in Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 8. Now other nations are watching. People are watching you and me. People are watching our church, right? And they're watching your church wherever you go. And so if the nations are looking and we're being obedient to be the witness that we're supposed to be, they will say, wow, you have a relationship with a living God. Do a lot of people not even know they can have a relationship with a living God? Yes, because they're all wrapped up in some kind of sacraments or they're wrapped up in all kinds of rituals and stuff and they don't know anything about getting in the word and having a relationship and hearing God speak to them through his word. And so that's what you want. Look, they have a great law. God has spoken to them. So you want people to be able to see in you there's a real God, his word is true, and you can have a relationship with him. So now, the nation of Israel, could they have had power if they were a witness, like they were supposed to be? As long as you're different, as long as they were separated, like he wanted them to be. Can you and I have a powerful witness to the people around us if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us and give us victory in our life and our circumstances? Is it, is it a witness to other people? Yes, and people should look at you if you're going through something and they say, I don't know what you have, but I want it because I need victory in my life for all the circumstances, the, the trials that I go through. The nation of Israel had power as a witness because they had a relationship with God the other nations did not have. People ought to see that you have such a relationship with God that they should want it. Say, how do I get that? And they had the word of God. Had they heard the voice of God? Yes, because they were at Mount Sinai and it says his voice was like a trumpet and it was loud and it got louder and they were afraid. We hear God speak to us right here. You open his book. He will speak. Now, had they seen his mighty hand, they should have been an amazing witness. To, to think of all that God did for them and God, what God showed them, they should have had lots of power as a witness. But there's a danger. He said, if you forget the Lord and if you forget his work, you, his word, you will never be the witness that I need you to be. You will not. So they have a challenge. By conducting their lives in conformity with the demands of the law. Aren't you glad we don't live under the law? Israel would have been able to function as God's servant nation. They would have been able to do it if they would have just been obedient to his commands. They would have been able to represent God and his character to the nations of the world. Throughout their history, they have to grapple with the reality, I am related to all nations through creation. But God called her to be separate from them. It's no different with you and I, right? Are we in this world? But we're not supposed to be of the world. So they were with all these other nations, a lot of pagan nations. But God called you to be separate. Same thing with you and I. So what happened to them? Because they forgot the word of God and they forgot him. They began to live, talk, and behave like all the other nations. The other nations, the culture had a tremendous effect on them. And it got to where the, they were so permeated with the culture, you could not tell they were a, supposed to be a separated people. That's what's happened to the church at large today. Now, remember there is a true church. But the true church is not Baptist or Pentecostal or Methodist or anything else. The true church is an invisible body 
of people who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and they are born again. Right? Okay. And they are coming under sanctification. They're surrendered to the Holy Spirit. We're growing. That is an invisible body. But many churches, you know, the buildings and everything and the people in them, you can't tell the difference between them and the culture. So they began to live, talk, and behave like the other nations, and they made no difference, and they weren't even living a holy life. So the nations were beginning to look at them, and what were they saying? They're just like us. They live like us, and they worship all these other gods just like we are. Did, did the nation of Israel, even though they had the one true living God, did they begin to immerse themselves with all the gods of wood and uh, uh, stone? I started to say wood, hay, and stubble. I've said that so much lately. Okay. The gods of wood and stone. And they looked at the other cultures and they said, oh, well, no. And they just started serving all these other gods. So now God's going to begin to raise up prophets. And I know you're wondering when I'm going to get to the fish gate. But I'm, we had to have all this background, and we're getting there. So we've got all these prophets, and the inexorable decline was marked by the rise. God said, okay, I'm going to send all these prophets, and they are now going to warn the people of God's grave displeasure at the failure. You are not reflecting my character for all the world to see. Was that what he told them way back? And they have failed, so now he's going to send prophets. So Israel failed to be the kind of witness God desired. The nation turned away from the Lord and his word. And what happened? The ten tribes, they are going to be taken captive to Assyria. So that's happened in our lesson. We have jumped way ahead. And now we've got only two little tribes left. We're going to talk about Judah, the southern tribe called Judah and it's the, uh, Judah and Benjamin would be left, and they're all alone in the land. All right? The northern tribes are gone and been sent everywhere in all kinds of directions. So it's just the nation of Judah, and we're coming to King Manasseh. King Manasseh was a king of Judah. He's the only, he is the most wicked king that they said ever ruled. And he is the first king... I think I've got that on the next slide. He's the first king that did not have a king over here with the northern tribes because they're gone. So he's the first king of Judah where there's not any northern kingdom over here. It's gone. All right? You understand that? Okay. So let's look at Manasseh. He's 12 years old when he starts to reign. Who was his father? Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was known as a pretty good king. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he's going to reign for 55 years in Jerusalem. But he does evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all the abominations of all these nations out there that the Lord had cast out before he ever let the children of Israel go into the land. And who was it? The Amorites. You remember way back... We've had a lesson. God sent the people to Egypt. He said, I'm going to give the Amorites 400 years. And he rained favor on them. And they, he just wanted them to look to him and see that he is the true God. But what did it say? Each generation got worse and worse and worse until their cup of iniquity was full. And he says, Manasseh is worse than that. That's what he's saying. Now we go on. Manasseh led the kingdom of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray into idolatry and practiced deeds that were more evil than the Amorites. That is a wicked nation who is in people who are supposed to be God's people. He rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah, his father, had already broken down. You know, that happens a lot. You have a good leadership, and they get a lot of good things done. They pass off, and then you get a wicked one that comes in and undoes all the good that was done. He led people into idolatry, and he started putting up all the altars to Baal again. You see all that he's doing. 
He made an Asherah pole. This was a wicked goddess. A lot of despicable practices when you worshipped Asherah. Just as King Ahab of Israel had done. Now the fact that they compared him to Ahab is a damning, damning indictment of this southern ruler. I wouldn't want to be compared to doing something just like Ahab did. But that's how he is compared. He took this carved Asherah pole and he put it in the temple of Solomon. Where the Lord had sworn, this is where I'm putting my name forever. He made them worship and he led them into worshiping the host of heaven, the sun, the moon, and the stars. He put idols in the temple. There was only supposed to be one altar in the temple court. But what did Manasseh do? He added all kinds of altars to all these other gods. And he said Jehovah was just one God among many. To Molech, he caused his own sons to pass through the altar of fire in the valley of Hinnom. Yes. He practiced soothsaying. He used witchcraft and sorcery. He consulted mediums and spirits. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord and provoked him to provoke God to anger. We can understand why, what was going on. He sacrificed his sons, and now he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood because he murdered anybody that stood in his way. He became the most evil king of Judah. God began speaking. Prophets were rising up. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to the people, but they would not listen. What is it going to take to change this? Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria. The Assyrians were known to be cruel and ruthless. And what happened? This is the king. They put hooks in his nose. They bound him with bronze chains, and they carried him off to Babylon. And I'm reminding you that's about a 900-mile trip. And this is how they took the king. And he was there for quite a few years. And it says, Wearsby says, he was treated like a steer being led to slaughter, and he deserved it. Because he was the leadership And not only did he do it, it said he caused the people. He was the example, and he led the people to do the same thing. So years later, a few years later, he's in affliction. He implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and he prayed to him, and God received his entreaty, and he heard his supplication. Man, do you see the long-suffering and the mercy of God in his grace? And they brought him back to Jerusalem and let him be king again. And Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. He was a changed man from this point on. He repented from evil and it says he feared the Lord. Now Matthew tells us if we are born again and we have turned our hearts to God, should there be fruit in our life to bear uh, fruit of repentance? Should it show in our life? Yes. Well, let's see what happened. When he got back home, he proved the reality of his conversion. He's trying to undo all the evil that he had done before. And there's a lot to undo. He set about living to obey God. He got rid of all the idols on the high places throughout the land. The temple was cleared of idols and objects that God had forbidden. Altars to false gods in the temple and the city were pulled down and removed. He repaired the altar of the Lord. He sacrificed peace offerings and thank thank offerings on it. And he commanded the people of Judah to begin serving the Lord God of Israel. What a change in this man. After this, we're coming to the fish gate. I know y'all have been waiting. After this, Manasseh built a wall outside the city of David. Now go back with me because we're we're back in the days of before the exile. So we've had the city of David, and he's going to build a wall now. I've got a map in a minute. On the west side of the Gihon Spring, come through the valley, and he is going to build a wall clear around to the entrance of the fish gate. First time this is mentioned in the Bible. 
And he enclosed the Ophel. The Ophel is behind the city of David, and it's the built-up portion that leads to the temple. And he raised it to a very great height. And then he's going to put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah, and he, he strengthens and fortifies the fish gate. That's the witness gate. Now, here's a map. So we see here, now this little map shows Nehemiah's day, and not quite all of that was there. But the Gihon Springs I've got in the red box. You see it? Okay. So from the Gihon Spring, he's going to go west, and you follow the red line, and he now builds this fortified wall, clear up, and he fortifies the fish gate. That's the witness gate. That's the marketplace. So that's what he did. And that's your first mention of the fish gate in the whole Bible. Okay, so you kind of know what he's done now. Will punishment still follow? Yes. Think of David, King David. After he repented, God forgave him, but did he suffer consequences? So we still have punishment. It appears as though God took his hand off the nation and allowed all the filth to pour out of the people's hearts. Now, if, we, if you and I just look at the prophets and what they said about Manasseh, the portrait that they paint is a mass murderer and an idol worshiper whose reign was so tainted it would later be the cause of the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in the temple and the temple in 586. What was all that blamed for? Because of all the evil that Manasseh did, even though he repented and tried to undo. Now, because Manasseh, king of Judah, committed these abominations, he did wickedly above all that the Amorites did. Above all that the Amorites did. They were pagans, which were before him and has made Judah also to sin. He was the leader, right? They're following the king. With his idols, here's the prophecy about him in 2 Kings 21. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says because of all that. Behold, I am bringing such evil on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hear of it will tingle. The evil is going to be horrific. He goes on to say, I'm going to wipe out Jerusalem as one wipes a dish. I'm going to wipe it and turn it upside down. I'm going to forsake the remnant of my inheritance, and I'm going to give them to the enemy. I think America better wake up. Now, it says, Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much. Listen to this. He filled with blood. From, he filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Beside his sin, wherewith he made Judah to sin, and doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay? He's died. Now, two years later, we have good King Josiah. And Josiah, who's his grandson, comes to power. And he's going to rule for 31 years. Even King Josiah, the Bible praises him as the greatest king since David could not turn away God's wrath. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did. Listen to Josiah. With all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his strength, in accordance with all the law of Moses. What a godly man to come up and rule and be the king now of the nation of Israel. A similar explanation is given a few years later for these military raids that are now going to come upon the nation of Israel under Jehoiakim, who is the great-grandson of Manasseh. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar's coming, and Jehoiakim becomes his servant for three years. And after three years, Jehoiakim has had enough, and he rebels and turns against Nebuchadnezzar. And what happened? The Lord sinned against him. Here comes bands of the Chaldeans, bands of the Syrians, bands of the Moabites, bands of the children of Ammon, and he sent them all against Judah to destroy it. According to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. 
Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command. I'm in 2 Kings 24. In order to remove them from God's presence. Why? Because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done. And he's been dead quite a while. Now, punishment still follows. And it's also because of the innocent blood that he shed. Remember, he filled the streets of Jerusalem with the blood of the people who would not do what he said. And that came against him. And it says, the Lord would not pardon. Now, Manasseh died in 643 B.C., Jeremiah begins prophesying about 16 years later, and it is now 627 B.C. So many years after King Manasseh's death, we've got Jeremiah the prophet, and God still remembered King Manasseh's sins against the king of Judah. And the Lord said to me in Jeremiah 15, 1-4, Even if Moses, did Moses intercede for the people? Did Samuel. And God said, even if Moses and Samuel were standing here before me, my mind would not be favorable to this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. He's talking about the nation of Israel. And it shall be, or Judah, if they say to you, where should we go? Here's what you're going to tell them. Such is for death, you're going to death. Those that will be for the sword the sword, such as for famine to the famine, and such as are for captivity to the captivity. So some are going to die, some are going to be killed by the sword, some are going to be uh, with the famine, and some are going to be taken captive. And God says, I'm going to appoint over them four forms of destruction, the sword to slay them, the dogs to drag, because after they were killed, they left their bodies out. Remember, and the beast and the dogs and everything will come. Then the birds of the heavens and the beast of the earth to devour and destroy. And I'm going to hand them over to trouble to all the kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. Now, God had chosen them to be a blessing to the nations. Is that the message of the fish gate? Yes, You're supposed to be the blessing, the witness. Protect this marketplace. Transform it. But now they're going to become abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth, and they're going to become an object of scorn. If God were to postpone judgment, it would only encourage them to continue sinning even more. And God was getting very weary with all the repenting. Do not think God enjoys sending judgment to his people. If he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, which we're told in Ezekiel, he certainly has no pleasure in the death of his own people. Is God long-suffering? But when his people keep resisting his gracious call and they rebel against his will, he had no alternative but to send the chastening. I have a chart up here that shows all the prophets that he sent. Quite, a, quite an amazing list, is it not? Now, you see that for the nation of Judah, this is for the southern kingdom, for the nation of Judah, he sent six prophets before they were taken into captivity to warn them over and over and over again. The Lord sent prophet after prophet to warn the Israelites of very severe consequences if they did not repent of their apostasy. Not only did he want them to repent, he wanted them to fulfill his purpose. I told you I wanted you to be a witness and point all people to me. But time after time, the people did not heed the warning, and now they're going to suffer for it. Then we come to Zephaniah, a book you probably have not looked at very much. Zephaniah is the prophet during good King Josiah. So we're going to go back and look at Josiah's reign. He, his primary target for God's message of judgment was Judah, who had fallen into grievous sin under the reign of King Manasseh. And here's Zephaniah's message to them. 
He implores them to turn back to godliness and to purity. Be that holy nation that God called you to be because you're a nation that is sinful to your core. I think he would tell us that now. They built their own places of worship to revere other gods and they desecrated the temple and the dwelling place of God. But we look at King Josiah. He is a remarkable young man. It tells us that he began reforming the nation of Judah, and his, just think, his grandfather was Manasseh. In his eighth year, how old was he when he was crowned king? Eight. So now he's 16. We have a 16-year-old kid. In his eighth year, Josiah began to seek the Lord. That's amazing. His 12th year, so he's now 20, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem. And then in his 18th year, so he's about 26, he started and told them to begin repairs on the house of the Lord. Is the temple still standing? Yes, we have Solomon's beautiful temple. It was during these repairs, what did they discover all covered with dust? They discovered the book of law. So somebody cleaning found the book, the book of the law. Now, the neglect of the law... The fact that it was hidden somewhere in there and it gathered, it, it was lost. The neglect of the law shows the depth of the apostasy during Manasseh and his son Ammon, who ruled for two years. King Josiah discovered the extent of Judah's disobedience. It was revealed to him, and he saw we are in danger of God's wrath and he was so devastated as a 26-year-old, he rent his clothes in mourning because of how bad the nation had been. Now, he sends his advisors to Huldah, the prophetess who lives right there by the temple, to seek guidance. And you can find this in Second Kings and in Chronicles. And here's what she said. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man that's King Josiah, that sent you to me. Here's what you're going to tell him. Thus says the Lord, behold, that means stop and look. I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, everything he read, God says it's going to happen. Because they have forsaken me, they burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, this is amazing. To this young boy, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, here's what you're going to tell him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, you have humbled yourself before the Lord. When you heard what I spoke about this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation, they're going to become a curse. And you rent your clothes. You have wept before me, and I have heard you says the Lord God. Behold, this is for King Josiah only, I am going to gather you unto your fathers, and you're going to be gathered into your grave in peace, and your eyes will not see all the evil that I'm going to bring on this place. That is an amazing thing to me. And for a brief moment... I immediately thought of the rapture. <laughs> I immediately thought of it. Because the, the trouble and the tribulation that's coming on this world is for the wicked people. It is for the earth dwellers. And those that have humbled themselves, I just see it. it I'm not going to be dogmatic, but I almost see he is going to be spared seeing all that because of the, his heart and humbling himself and so forth. Then after this happens, what does he do? 
After reading the law of the covenant, Josiah made a covenant with the Lord and he demanded that the people take a stand and he had them out there. Then he began to purge all the land of false worship and he had them keep the Passover and this was the first time they've kept the Passover in 80 years since King Hezekiah. And they said it was a grand thing. So he did everything to get the people back to where they needed to be with God. Now, Josiah dies. What happened to the people? They became less different. Y'all with me? They became less different from the heathen people, and they pointed less and less to the God they were supposed to represent. Had they forgotten the message of the fish gate? You are to be my witnesses. You are to be my ambassadors. You are to transform the marketplace where you live. Zephaniah gives a warning in verses 1 and 2 and 10 and 11 of chapter 1. This little book of three chapters mentions the day of the Lord more than any other book in the Bible. He tells a lot about it. Now, I want to make sure you understand this. If you studied prophecy, you do. The Old Testament prophet that's called, he saw the peaks of prophecy, which in the Old Testament, he would see the first coming of Christ... And then he saw the second coming of Christ, because those are the peaks. But he was told nothing about the valley of the church age in between. They didn't see that. It wasn't a thing. Okay? Now, we call this prophetic telescoping. And so what happens, Zephaniah and all the other prophets, when they had a prophecy, especially where it says, in that day, most of the time, the prophecy would be partially fulfilled right here. But then the rest of it won't be finally fulfilled until later at, the, at his second coming. So we want to talk about the impending time of judgment on Judah and its destruction. But it also will be applied to in the tribulation period when Christ comes back. So here's verse 1. The word of the Lord comes to Zephaniah. We're in the days of King Josiah, who's the really good king. He's the king of Judah, and here's God's words. I will utterly consume all things from off the land. There shall be in that day. Here's, what we're gonna, here's your second uh, time in the Bible of the fish gate. The noise of a mournful cry from the fish gate. There will be a howling from the second now, there is a second quarter called right inside the fish gate where the rich lived in their fashionable houses built from the wages that were really owed to the poor. That still goes on. And then there's going to be a great crashing from the hills. So that's the prophecy. It would happen then with, Babel, uh, with Babylon coming, and it will happen also in the tribulation period. Now, he goes on to say, and he says, How will ye inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down, and all they that bear silver have been cut off. Maktesh was the market and business district where the merchants and bankers were located. Their wealth is going to be confiscated. If you look at Jeremiah 9.23, this is an interesting verse. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Don't, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Now, if we take that verse and put it with Zephaniah's prophecy, the fish gate is where the mighty men were put to fortify and take in, be on guard of the fish gate. And God says, don't let the mighty man glory in his might. With regard to the Mishnah, which was the second quarter, right inside the fish gate, this is where the wise men were, and in Zephaniah it says they'll be like blind men. And then he says, let not the rich man glory in his riches, and that was the division of the Maktesh where the rich people lived, and it says their silver and their wealth is going to be confiscated. Don't glory in those things. So here is the map. 
And if you see the rec red rectangle, that's the Mishnah, the second quarter, and the, the oval or the circle in hot pink right above it, that's your fish gate. Then right inside, as you come in the gate, is going to be that second quarter that he talked about. And then outside the fish gate, remember, that's where we have all this market pace. Kind of think of a flea market, you know, where everybody has their wares that they're selling. Now, in Zephaniah 1.7, he says, Hold your peace at the presence of the Lord God. In other words, be quiet. For the day of the Lord is at hand, and the Lord has prepared a sacrifice, and he's bidding his guests to come. Were they used to having sacrifices? Yes. So, but this sacrifice is going to be different that Zephaniah is prophesying. The host is God. The guests are the Babylonians. And who's the sacrifice? The people of Judah. That's that prophecy. God is going to punish them because they've abandoned his word. They've adopted all kinds of foreign practices. It says they were wearing foreign clothes and worshiping foreign gods. God's guest, the Babylonians, he's going to have them come into the city, plunder it, and destroy it. And they will search the city so carefully they will be able to find the people that are hiding. God's third picture of the day of the Lord, he says in Zephaniah, is a day of a great battle. And he gives a great description here. He says, hear the cries of the captives, shouts of the warriors. You see thunderclouds of judgment, flashes of lightning. You behold the victims, people of Judah, their blood is poured out like cheap dust and their entrails like filth. What a scene of destruction and carnage just because this nation refused to submit to the word of the Lord. The fire of God's jealous zeal is going to consume everything and it says no one will be able to escape. Even the wealthy... Their money's no good. They can't even ransom their lives. And the enemy will take away their ill-gotten riches. Zephaniah described an illustration of what's going to happen in the end times. God's judgment will fall on a wicked world in the tribulation period. This is God's wrath being poured out on people who have, will, have not trusted in him. The final day of the Lord will be far more terrible. If you read Revelation 6 to 19, you can read how terrible it's going to be. There will be cosmic disturbances that will affect the course of nature and cause people to cry out for a place to hide. You read in Revelation 6, I think it is, that they are crying for the rocks to, hide, to fall on them and kill them, but it won't happen. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I'm in Jeremiah 26 now, the God of Israel concerning this city of which you say, it will be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, famine, pestilence. This is a future you chose because you refused to repent. The days before her destruction marked the fulfillment of Jeremiah's words about a coming famine, pestilence, and sword. They were dark days full of terror and horror. If we go into the siege and the fall now of Jerusalem, this is... Uh, before they are exiled. It lasted from the winter months. Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. The winter months of Zedekiah's ninth year as king to the summer of his 11th year, you have about 30 months of an increasingly terrible situation. And they are laid siege inside because they're surrounded the siege and the fall was so terrible, the severe famine that came upon them, they were killing their own children and eating them. Severe. You think 30 months and you cannot get out. And the enemy is all around you, surrounded. Eventually, King Nebuchadnezzar delivered the final blow of Judah's destruction during the reign of King Zedekiah. He broke into Jerusalem. He killed as many as he desired. He looted the temple of Solomon. He set fire to Jerusalem, and he carried the people of Judah to Babylon as captives. God had said he would reject Jerusalem and the temple of Solomon because of the evil that King Manasseh had done. Zephaniah prophesied a cry... A mournful cry will come from the fish gate on the day of the Lord. And this cry came from the people of Judah 
as Nebuchadnezzar was coming in and killing all of them, setting everything on fire. They're at the fish gate. What had their, what had their command been? You're to be my witness. You're to point everyone to me. You're to be my ambassador. This was God's call. You're to be transforming your marketplace and protect it. And where did Nebuchadnezzar's army come in? At the fish gate. Because of their disobedience. The mournful cry from the fish gate. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you that we have your word. And I just pray that we will take everything we've learned in this lesson today, Lord, and we will heed your word. And I know that as your church... This is another called out assembly. And as your church, we are to be witnesses. We are to be transforming the marketplace. We're to be salt and light. We're to be bringing people to you and discipling. And Lord, I just pray that we will be obedient to that and heed your word. And I pray that in all we do, Jesus Christ will be lifted up. In whose name we pray, amen. I know, I know today's lesson was a little bit of a downer. I know that. <laughs> but we need to be kept aware. God is not only a God of love. He also will bring judgment. And he chastens. So we need to, we need to have a balanced view of him. And see how he prophesied and then how he carried things out. And next week we'll go to Nehemiah and see what happens when they're rebuilding the fish gate. Because it's been burned and torn down. So I hope you'll join me next week and y'all have a great week.